thank you all for coming. In the rare Clark appearance. I hope you feel that way when I get through. Okay, we're starting a new series today. And it'll go through this month and then the first Sunday of next month also for uh, six sessions. Um, that will be Matt and Rick and Leslie and uh, Bill Snell and myself. I'll do the first one and the last one. But uh, we decided to do something that we're calling Grace Is. Grace Is what? what what adjective would you put, what word would you fill in there? And if we did a poll of all of you, you'd all come up with, with probably something different. And I picked, uh, for the first session at least, that grace is scandalous. What I mean by that is, grace is scandalous to the flesh. Grace is scandalous to religion. Um, flesh loves religion. The, the do's of religion, the don'ts of religion, our flesh likes that because our flesh really desires to justify itself. It wants to have a part in our own justification. So you've got to give me something to do in order for me to feel like I'm being justified by my own effort. So, grace is scandalous. And if y'all listen fast, we'll get through fast, okay? But if I sense that you're not listening, we're just going to keep going on. Now let me read you a couple of verses uh, that kind of set the tone for what we're going to look at today. And a part of this uh, series is each of us will be giving at least brief areas of time of, of testimony about kind of our own journey in grace and how we kind of arrived at our, at, our, at least our partial understanding of grace. I, I know I don't understand all of it nor get it all, nor see it all. And I never will, probably, but I'm going to keep trying to understand more and more. My friend Jack Taylor, uh, who passed away this past year, um, he called me when I was back in my office preparing for Sunday. It was Sunday morning, and I'm just you know going over things in my mind and so forth. And he calls me. And when Jack calls you on Sunday morning, I always answer. He said, son, he said, the Lord woke me up at about 4 o'clock this morning. And I'm thinking, it'd have to be the Lord to wake me up that early. But he said, the Lord woke me up about 4 o'clock this morning, and I just felt compelled to call you and tell you what I heard from the Lord. He said, this is what the Lord spoke to me about to tell you. He said, as much as you know about grace, talking about me, he said, as much as you know about grace, and you do know a lot, he said, he said, as much as you know about grace, there's a whole lot more that you don't know than you do know. Meaning, you're never going to fully understand nor be able to receive nor even explore the vastness of God's grace and his love and his kindness and his gentleness. All, all of that. You'll never be able to really grasp it all. It's just too big and it's too good. And our human minds kind of just get blown in the process of receiving that and understanding that. Let me read you uh, Ephesians 1, uh, 5 through 8. And I've preached on all of Ephesians many times, and this is one of the portions of this that so blessed me. Ephesians 1, verse 5 says, He predestined us, talking about us, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will to the praise of the glory of his grace which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he lavished upon us in wisdom in all wisdom and insight, and made known to us the mystery of his will. Now, if you'll notice a couple of words that he used there, adjectives that he used there, um, 
He talks about the riches of his grace, the riches of God's grace. Okay, you have to think about that a moment. The riches of God's grace. If God is rich in anything, there's a whole lot of it, wouldn't you think? I mean, he's really big. Whatever he has, he has a lot of. Okay? So it's, it's the riches of his grace, which he did what upon us? Lavished upon us. He's lavished grace upon us. You know what lavish means, don't you? It means over the top. It means uh, a great abundance of, uh, even to the point of offending us in our flesh sometimes. Uh, you've been in places where something was done so lavishly until you think, whoa, this is really over the top. That's how you need to begin thinking about God's grace. Don't feel guilty ever about receiving it or believing it or letting yourself receive more of it. Because as much as you receive, there's more. He lavished his grace upon us. Now, in Ephesians 2, verse 4, It says, but God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he has loved us, even when we're dead in our trespasses and transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now there's a bunch of messages in there, lots of teaching in there. You could, and I have, done it many, many times on that passage of scripture. He raised us up with him, seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. In order, he did all that in order. In order to. This is a henna cloth. It means he did this for a reason, a purpose. and He wants to accomplish something. He did this to produce this. He did this in order to do this. He did all of this in order to do this. Okay? He raised us up with him, seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. In order that in the ages to come, all of the ages to come, in order that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. (sighs) So, Beginning now, for you, in all of the ages to come for you, God will be revealing to you the surpassing riches of his grace. Uh, That's what he's going to be doing. So, as much as you know about grace, there's a whole lot more about grace that you don't know than you do know. And God's going to reveal himself to us in those kinds of ways. The surpassing riches of his grace. So you see this richness of grace. Uh, Romans 5.20 uh, says this essentially, the law was given that sin might increase. The law was given that the understanding or knowledge of sin might increase. That it will show, the law will show how far behind we always are in our ability to keep the law. Therefore, it reveals to us our own weakness, our own helplessness, our own inability to do anything really to earn God's favor. We can't keep the law. The law came in that sin might increase, but where sin, the word, Greek word, abounded, where sin took off, where sin was revealed, where sin became what sin is to us, our understanding of it at least, where sin abounded. What does he say? Grace abounded all the more. Grace Again, the, the Greek word, huper, it would be grace superabounded. So if you think sin abounds, I can tell you this for a fact. 
Sin abounds all the more, all the more. It's super abound. So there's a lot of it. The depth of it is amazing. The goodness of it is amazing. So grace is scandalous. Scandalous. Uh, probably one of the more frequently asked questions or criticisms of people like us, like me, would be what? Would be, but you're giving people a license to sin. You're giving people an excuse to sin. You're giving, you're letting people off my hook. <laughs> you're letting people off the hook. Because everyone needs to be told what is right, what is wrong, what is good and what is evil, what is good and what is bad. And there obviously um, theological position in that is this. Do good, God is glad. Do bad, God is mad. Do good, you're blessed. Do bad, you're cursed. Uh, now, in really general terms, wouldn't you say that's primarily your takeaway from church in the past? Uh, better than that, probably. Um, softer than that. Kinder than that, in a lot of ways. Uh, more compassionate than that. But essentially, that's what comes out of a mixture teaching that combines law and grace. Do good, God's glad. Do bad, God's mad. Do good, you're blessed. Do bad, you're cursed. You're living under a curse. And <clears throat> we know different, don't we? You, you all know the parable of the prodigal son, don't you? This is yes and this is no. You do, right? Yeah. Uh, if you went to church, you were taught that parable many, many times. The emphasis of the parable in many ways was the younger son, the, quote, prodigal son. But really, in fact... The, the, the word prodigal means extravagantly wasteful. So, in some ways, that does apply to the boy. But I think this extravagant wastefulness, this prodigalness, is more about the father than it is about the son. God was extravagant, even to the point of our flesh saying wasteful. To treat a boy that did what he, a son that did what he did in the way you treated him just doesn't seem right, does it? it there's something about our flesh that's, oh, you know, he, he needed a beating, that's what he needed, you know. And he got one, folks, one of his own making. The father didn't do it, he did it to himself. I think the father allowed it so he could come to his senses there. So he'd have a chance before he got much older to be able to come to his senses and begin to understand the nature of his father's love for him and commitment to him. The father was the one that was extravagantly wasteful or prodigal. He was prodigal in his forgiveness. He was prodigal in the fact that he gave the boy his inheritance to start with. Wastefully extravagant in that. Not, not many of us as fathers would do that, and I don't know that we should, but this father did. He was extravagant in his forgiveness. He was extravagant in his kindness to him. He was extravagant in his love for him. He was extravagant in his gifts to him, what he gave him when he got home. He was extravagant in his willingness and capability of restoring him the restoration to not his sonship, but restoration to his place in the family, his acceptance in the family. 
And you never hear beyond that parable, you never hear a word beyond that, that it was anything different in the future. God's grace is extravagant, could be deemed extravagantly wasteful. Let me read you just a couple of quotes. And you won't see me do this very often but from a phone. But listen to this. This is a friend of mine uh, whose name is Ty Cobb. He lives in West Texas. I uh, was in, preached and taught many times in, in the church where he goes and so forth. He said, if the good news of his grace doesn't sound outrageously scandalous, you may not be hearing the real gospel. If part of you doesn't rise up offended at the sheer excess and extravagance of grace, you may not be hearing the true gospel. If the news of his goodness and grace doesn't seem to be too good to be true and completely unfair, you may not have heard the pure gospel of grace. I agree with that. I really do. If it doesn't come to a place of almost shocking you in your religious sensibilities, you're not hearing all of it or receiving all of it or understanding it, really. It is shocking. I remember moments in my life when I was shocked by what I saw and began to think. And my immediate response to that almost every time at first was, this is too good to be true. It can't be this good. God can't be this good. It takes a while to deconstruct from your religious understanding to be able to receive without hesitation and without reservation the great love and grace of our Father. Now here's another quote from Malcolm Smith, um, a teacher of grace. <laughs> he says, if your mouth has never hung open at the grace of God, a jaw-dropping, mouth hanging open, if your mouth has never hung open at the grace of God, you have never seen it. I, I believe that's the case, actually. That all of us at moments have this and have had this kind of, oh my gosh, moment where you feel the blowing away of your religious sensibilities. Grace to us, to the flesh, to the natural mind and the religious mind is simply too good to be true. It can't be that good. My response at times when people are, are critical uh, no one here, I'm talking about people, people I know, you know, around, uh, is usually pretty straightforward. I don't try to convince them of anything. I more testify to them than anything else. But my response to them is, Do you think God is going to be mad at me for spending as much of my life as I possibly could, at least, telling people how good God is? You think me bragging on God and bragging on His grace and bragging on His kindness and His love and His compassion and His mercy and all of the attributes and characteristics that I've come to see God have... You think God's going to be mad at me for telling everybody my whole life that he's really, really, really good father? No, no, He's going to crown me. <laughs> but not a chance. Which father in this room is going to be really upset at their kids for telling everybody their whole lives how wonderful he is? Not me. So, it's what I'm trying to get you to see in this is let your mind be blown by the goodness of it. Go ahead and let it be blown. Whatever you're thinking about how possibly good God is or His grace is or His love is, regardless of how much you let yourself receive and believe, I promise you that it's better than you think. 
He's bigger than you think. He's better than you think. He's more gracious than you think. He's more merciful than you think. He's more caring and kind and compassionate than you think. He's bigger than your mind has a capacity to understand. So never get tired of that. Never allow yourself to stop in some place. Continue to move forward in receiving the riches of his grace revealed to us in Christ Jesus. Okay? Keep pushing forward because there's more where that came from. Okay, let me just do a little testifying uh, about, people ask me this again all the time, when, when, how, when, where, all this, did you kind of come to see this and begin to teach it and so forth? Now I can tell you, it came in bits and pieces. It came over a long period of time. It came after much, 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 uh, what, ill ease on my part to where... Uh, it's, it's like I knew something was wrong with the way I saw things and the way we saw things. I, I just felt like something is wrong with this. Because, you know, half, uh, half of the time since I was born again, half the time in the beginning stages, I felt guilty still. I, I felt like I didn't measure up. I really felt like I wasn't doing as well as I could. <clears throat> I wasn't acting as well as I could act and so forth and so on. I felt like that. When I met the Lord and really believed, <clears throat> I, was, uh, I was almost 20 years old, the summer after my freshman year in college. And I remember this. It was such an incredible event in my mind. This, this was a mind-blowing event. I could have never foreseen myself believing. I could have never, never even thought about being a Christian. I, I, you know, I had no thoughts about that. I, 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 it never occurred to me. It never crossed my mind. It never invaded my thoughts in any measure. And this abrupt, I mean, I went to this crusade and went down and prayed and received. Okay, that's what I did. But that was such a... <laughs> an event in my life that was out of the order, out of uncharacteristic for me. I went under duress to start with. I was determined that this was going to be a bunch of bull and so forth. And yet it wasn't. I remember the months after that. I remember feeling like for the first time in my life that God loved me and I loved him. So that's what I told everybody. <laughs> but then I started going to church. <laughs> and then, I don't, I don't mean to be critical, they, they did as well as anybody did. You know what I mean. But it wasn't long after that getting involved in church and becoming a part-time youth pastor in the church where I went and so forth. I, I was miserable, honestly, internally miserable. I, the more I learned and listened, the more it felt like every, more stuff was heaped, heaped upon me. It wasn't that I was getting some relief about the fact that I wasn't hardly keeping up with everybody else in my moral performance. It felt like every time I went to church, there was something else added to the list. Frankly, here's what happened over a period of time. I kind of checked out on all that. I just thought to my mind, if this is the way it is, God, I'm doing the best I can. I, I'm, I'm, at least I'm going to get to go to heaven, I, I think. And I just kind of checked out and thought, well... I guess I'll have to let the pieces fall where they will and hope God's good enough to forgive me. But it was miserable. I, I didn't feel a spiritual energy, even though I was told you need to pray more. So I prayed. I'm, I'm going to do what they tell me to. And there was a group of people on campus there uh, that prayed a lot. So I went to the group and prayed and prayed and prayed. And we prayed and I prayed. And 
and you know, I didn't know necessarily how to pray, but I'm praying as best I can, and, and I'm trying to stop all the things that I feel like are wrong in my life and uh, to correct uh, you know, some lifetime uh, bents and, and things that I was weak in and so forth, trying to systematically shore up the pieces of my life. I was devout in my heart. I wanted to please God. But I was miserable. Came to a place quickly where I told the Lord, I, I said, I, I, I'm miserable. If it wasn't for the heaven part, Lord, I wish this had never happened to me. Because I was happier before than I am now. That was my state of mind, state of being. And it stayed that way. I gained some ground and do better and, you know, so forth and so on. And, uh, but it, generally speaking, was like that. Even when I started pastoring early in my, I started very young. Uh, I was 27 when I started pastoring a church. And every once in a while I'd throw in a, you know, kind of a God loves you a little bit message, but most of the time it's, it's trying to get them to act right. Try, doing my best to get them to act correctly for their own sakes, for their own good, you know. I'm trying to help them get to the place where they act right. So a lot of the message would be mo motivational messages. How to do this and how to do that and how to overcome and how to be happy, which I'm miserable myself, but, I, you know, and that was kind of... I know people that were there at the church. God did lots of wonderful things and blessed and all that kind of stuff. And they don't look back at it the same way I do. But I look back at it and think, I wish I had known then what I know now. That's what I wished. As a matter of fact, at the 25th anniversary of that church, we went back many years ago now. I mean, this is, the church was begun in 1978. So I went back to the 25th anniversary and talking to all the people that were there, different ones there, friends and, you know, people that we've come close to, they look back on those se that season of time in their life in the, in the years, early years and through the years of, it was Gateway Church is what, what it was, what we called it. They look back on it with a great fondness and say it's, a, it's the, the most wonderful spiritual season of our lives. And I'm thinking, how in the world could yet be true for you in what I taught you. But I guess it is. God's grace. Okay, here, here's kind of a, a sequence of events that began changing. I have, I have an old notebook where I was in this little bedroom of this old house that we'd rented for an office space, and we were a new church. We're growing fast. We're trying to build buildings, do things, and all this stuff. And I, I remember and have notes to that effect that even in maybe 1981, 80, 80 79, uh, in that time frame, I started writing uh, some things. And, and that, what is grace? What does grace mean? What is this? What show me? You know, all this kind of stuff, just notes. And so it started then. There's I, the feeling that something's wrong. If it's wrong for me, it must be wrong for them too. That's what I thought. If it's making me semi-miserable in my religiosity, it must be making them miserable too, and they're hiding it real well. That doesn't mean there weren't some good things. There were a lot of good things, but there was this permeating sense that there's more than this. There's got to be more than this. I'd read the book of Acts, and I'd think, you know, they seem to be really fired up and happy and all this kind of stuff, and I don't get it. I don't understand it. I, I don't feel that way, and I don't see our people really feeling that way either, honestly, most of the time. So it started there, started reading. It wasn't anything to read. I, I looked for books. I didn't look hard enough. There were some real ancient books, old, old authors and all that, that I could have read if I'd known about them, but I didn't know about them. I know about some of them now, but I didn't then. And so there was nobody to talk to. I didn't know anyone to talk to. And then finally, I kind of connected 
with through the Lord's provision and so forth, connected with one person, uh, Dudley Hall, who became a great friend of mine and has been all my life almost. Uh, we started talking about it. We were on a board together at this magazine, and we, we started talking about grace. And I would say something to him, and he'd say, oh, yeah, and then he'd say something back to me, and I'd say, I hadn't thought of that. Uh, and you know, So we, we gained a little ground in our understanding. I started teaching the things that I'd learned. For instance, I knew bits and pieces and parts, and I still would preach in th- those bits and pieces and parts exactly the same way I, I do now. It wasn't that I was wrong. I only had bits and parts. Parts, parts of it, but not the whole, not the integration of it. So it, 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 it would seem like, uh, yeah, I mean, all this is true, but what about this? What about this? There's always a what about. For instance, <clears throat> well, I'll skip that part. Okay. There's a lot of ground that I gained during that time in bits and pieces and slowly. Here was, a, here was one turning point. In probably, I don't know, sometime in the 80s, uh, early 80s or mid 80s uh, I'd become a part of a group of people uh, and it got invited to this little meeting there was about 25 of us in this home this room in Dallas uh, some people pretty big shots of the time you know James Robinson and uh, people like that were in the room with me Jack was there uh, several other people I knew most of them and I'm a what a 20 9, 30 year old, 30, 31, and at that point in time, uh, and I was invited to listen to Roy Hessian, and I'd heard that Roy Hessian probably knew some things about grace. He wrote Calvary Road, which had some grace in it, quite a bit of grace in it, and at that point in time, he was 82 years old. And so Roy, they invited Roy to come, and he did, and all of us, and he's teaching us. I still have the notes of what he taught. I can take you to them right now. And he's teaching along, and all this has been percolating in me for a long time. And while he's going, I, I had a question. And, I, I mean, I'm the youngest one there, the least, anyway, I tentatively raised my hand to this wonderful 82-year-old gentleman. And I said, can I ask, may I ask a question? And of course, everybody's eyes turned toward me, and I'm thinking, oh boy. What are they going to think? He said, before I let you ask a question, he said, do you, do you mind letting me ask you a question? I'm thinking, oh no, I don't know anything. Don't ask me a question. <laughs> It's not going to turn out well. He said, let me ask you a question. I said, okay. He said, when you preach, do you preach good advice or good news? He said, now before you answer that, I want you to know that good advice is good advice. He said, good advice has a place in life and in our lives, and it does, doesn't it? But he said, even if you're preaching good advice, always end it with good news. But what he's saying is, bring them back to the reality of the good news of the gospel. I don't know that he understood it all, really, but that was a turning point in my thinking. I thought, I have preached good advice almost every time I've preached in the past. I am determined that from this point forward, every time I preach, it's going to be good news and not good advice, not alone. And so what that did to me was challenge me. I said, well, what am I going to teach on? If I don't teach good advice, I don't have a whole lot to say. (laughs) So I thought, well, I'm going to start trying to find out everything I can know about the gospel, the good news about Jesus, about how he interacts with us, and so forth and so on. So that's what I did. That was a turning point. Here's another turning point. In 1988, uh, 87, I'll never forget this, 1987, I'm alone in my office, pastor of this big church, still wrestling, I'm learning some things, have learned some things, gained some ground, and I'm making headway. That's what I felt. 
I was just again reading 1 John 1. 1 John 1, the first eight verses of 1 John 1, essentially says the one that we've seen, the one that we've been with, the one that we know, the one that we've uh, intimately acquainted with, we want you to know him like we know him. That's essentially what John is saying to a group of really unbelievers, of Jews, really, of unbelievers. Okay, that's what it says. Now, 1 John 1, 9 changes things. As you know, 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, or righteous, to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, when I read 1 John 1, 9, with a little bit different eye, all of a sudden, it was one of those jaw-dropping, almost gasp in my spirit. And I thought, oh, my Oh, my God. Oh, dear God. And it just crashed into me. See, 1 John 1, 9 isn't a verse for a Christian, really. It, all verses are for us, but I'm, I'm saying it's not aimed toward us. It's trying to get people to understand how to know God through their faith in Christ. We want you to know him like we know him, and this is the way you can know him. If you confess or agree with God, come into agreement with God about the fact that you got, you, you're helpless, that, that your, your, your sin seems to be uh, bigger than God. If you confess the fact that you're a sinner, agree with God, come into agreement with him about that. He will be faithful, and he will be just to do two things. What's he, what's he going to be faithful and just to do? To forgive us of our sins. Okay, I had a new understanding of that. I, I believe that God forgive if you, would forgive if you ask him to. But if you don't confess and, a, and a, before you ask him to forgive you, he won't forgive you because you've got to confess. If you confess, he'll be faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. And what I saw new in this was, he forgives me of all my sins, past sins, present sins, future sins. That the sin issue, as far as I'm concerned, is done. It's fixed. It's over with. I'm forgiven no matter who I am or what I've done. It crashed. I thought, oh. And then I thought, I need to look at confession. And Alan can tell you from the early portion of the time we've been together, that's something I taught in, in many different venues. It makes an, a very big, uh, important difference when you understand the word confess, homo legeo, to agree with, to come into understanding. To... Anyway, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just forgive your sins, which he did all of them. But he didn't stop there. He went the next step, and this was another step I had never seen or didn't fully get. He will cleanse us, cleanses you from all unrighteousness. All of it. All unrighteousness. Any bit of unrighteousness, unrighteous essentially means right standing with God. You're okay with God. You're right with God. You could say it like, I'm be right with God, whatever that means. There'd be no issues between me and God. He cleansed me from all issues that caused any degree of separation between me and God. Cleanse me of all of that. All unrighteousness, all of it. All of it present, all of it future. All of it past. Cleanse me. Another key element, that was when I started seeing the difference in covering and cleansing. Covering and cleansing. God doesn't cover our sin, as many teach. He cleanses us of our sin. Though your sins be as scarlet, they should be white as snow. Though they, they, they appear to be crimson, they are as wool. You're cleansed of your sins. Meaning there's no sin attachment to you at all, ever. You're cleansed. That's what makes you a new creation. You've been cleansed. New creations have no past. New creations have no, no history with sin. You're new. You're new. 
So that set me off studying these different things. And I was kind of off to the races then. Now, there were other things that were a challenge in the future, uh, uh, theological things that I had to work through. Now, I'm going to quickly bring this to a conclusion. Here's the biggest thing toward the end of all this process that I began to see that changed everything and put all the pieces together for me. I learned to rightly divide the Word of God, as 1 Timothy says. To rightly divide the Word of God. Now, what that really means is, as I've come to understand, is it divides everything between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. That's the division line. Who was it that instituted and ratified the New Covenant? It was Jesus. At what point in time? At his death, burial, and resurrection. When Jesus was raised, the New Covenant was in effect. It came into effect. The Old Covenant, he says, uh, Hebrews says it all over the place, says that it is, it has, the old has passed away. It has become illegitimate as a, uh, uh, an overseer of your spiritual life. It's gone. It's passed away. The new has come. The old is gone. Do you understand? The Old Covenant today doesn't even exist for the Jews. The Jews aren't under the Old Covenant because it's not there anymore. The Old Testament is, the Ten Commandments are, all that, but the Old Covenant is not there. It's gone. It's passed away. Even Jews are not under the Old Covenant. There's nobody under the Old Covenant. It's gone. We're all under the New Covenant. And I began seeing that and understanding that to a certain degree. Now, this is the part of the New Covenant that really endeared me to God, really more than more and more and more, is that I began to understand that under the Old, God desired... The way it works, covenants are all conditional. You do your part, I do my part. That's a, condition, that's a covenant. Yeah. You do your thing, I do my deal. You do this, I do this. I do this, you do this. You each have a part in a covenant, a responsibility. And under the old, you know what it was. Your responsibility is to keep the law, every bit of it, and never break one of them. Which God knew when he instituted it that it was totally impossible for us to do that and he wanted to show mankind that but in the new covenant God did do his part but let me tell you something else he did our part too he did both parts the covenant was between God and his son Jesus Jesus kept the law for us Now, that led me to a different way of interpreting Scripture, which cleared everything up. I mean, it just like, okay, there's another one of those. I got it. I I get it. I see it. All this stuff begins to make sense when you see it. As Martha said one time, grace is logical. It's logical. It comes to logical conclusions, not illogical ones, not mysterious ones, not not, uh, confusing ones as religion does and the law does. It becomes clear that when you interpret... See, it's one thing to study scriptures or read scriptures and another thing to interpret scripture. You understand? You've got to learn to interpret it correctly, to understand what it means from the proper context and from the proper viewpoint. After, After the resurrection of Jesus, everything changed. We were under the new. The Apostle Paul had began to have a great handle on this. That when you look at scripture, with Old Testament, or even really Jesus' teachings, Jesus was still under the law. He operated under the law when he taught. But what he was doing, like in the Sermon on the Mount, he's raising the bar for everyone there. He's saying, you Jews think you can keep this? Well, you can't. Let me just tell you, no matter how you do this machinations in your mind, you can't do it. You think you can and think you are, but you are deadly wrong about this. That's really what he's saying. He's saying, for instance, if your hand offends you, Cut it off. He's saying, you have heard that it is said for a man, it's not right for a man to commit adultery. But I tell you this, I tell you, you've heard this was said. I tell you this, that even if a man looks at a woman with lust in his heart, he's committed adultery with her. Well, that in the natural is not true. In the spiritual, it was. And Jesus is raising the bar. He's saying, you don't have a hope of keeping this. So when you look at his teachings, 
you begin to see grace even in the Sermon on the Mount. Because he did say things, this is kind of the way it's going to be in the future. You know, this is the way God's going to treat you. If, you, if someone demands your coat, give it to him. But don't stop there. Go ahead and give him your shirt too. <laughs> I think, oh, no, I don't want to do that. That's what God did. He, he's, he's super abundant in his giving. It blows your mind. It's not, it's not based upon your, uh, what, uh, you uh, measuring up to get it. It's just given. So I learned to interpret scripture. So all of the Old Testament, you don't take isolated verses out of the, out of the Old and teach. You, you're not going to see the reality of it if you do. Now, there's pictures there. All of it's about Jesus. He, he said that, all the words about him. So you learn to interpret the Old Testament scriptures as it points to Christ. You understand the Gospels, for instance, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You understand this is a record of what happened then. There's some little bits and pieces of Jesus' teaching in there, but it wasn't a whole lot. But you learn to interpret all those events, all the things that happen through the lens of the new covenant. That's the way you see it. And everything changed. When Jesus said, the disciples one day said, Lord, teach us to pray. Remember that? Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5. And he said, well, pray like this. Our Father... Who art in heaven. Well, their minds are already blown right there. They would never have called God my father, our father. Ever. They wouldn't even mention his name. They made up a name. Because they didn't want to say his name. They didn't feel worthy of saying his name. I, I get that under the law. He prayed like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, our sins, as we forgive those who trespass against us. For thine is the power, the glory, honor forever. And almost everything he said in that blew their minds. Even though it's still under the law. It's still law. But he's putting things in there, isn't he? Our Father, forgive. Even if it's required that we forgive first, it's still he forgives. He's showing the little pieces of the new covenant that's coming at his resurrection. And Paul just hit it out of the park in interpreting the word for us. He said, I, I went to the third heaven. I saw things that are not permissible for a human being even to talk about. So, that's where we are today. I'll never get over it. Never will. This is what we do, folks. This is what we all do for the rest of our lives. We extend, do our best to teach, to talk about, and live the great good news of the gospel of grace. Grace is scandalous. And if it's not to you, you got some more to learn and to receive. Okay, once you stand, let me pray for you. I thought this was going to be real short, but obviously it never is. Lord, thank you for this day and for the privilege, Lord, the honor, the honor of knowing you. How can we say thanks, Lord, for all you've done, all you are, all you've provided? I just want to say it to you almost every time I talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now let's worship together for a moment, please.